going? You're live. I'm live. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Jeremy West. I'm um, here at the Strand Theater in Hudson Falls, New York. We're trying a little experiment, um, trying to get together and talk about music, listen to some music. And um, hopefully this will uh, develop into a, a cool new uh, aspect of this uh, really neat uh, performing arts center here. So um, tonight I'm going to talk about two uh, groups, Scott Joplin and the Beatles. Two groups that kind of seem not super related to each other, but um, this weekend we have the Chevalier Ballet coming up and they're going to be dancing to the music of Scott Joplin tomorrow night, Friday night, and then Saturday, they're going to be dancing to the music of the Beatles. So um, both of those acts are two, two um, the Beatles and Scott Joplin, two group, um, styles of music that I really appreciate quite a bit. And I thought I would come and talk a little bit about them. And it kind of got me thinking, like, sometimes I, I like to, as um, a teacher, try to connect different aspects of music, things that I find interesting in often um, disparate, maybe um, very um, uh, different, uh, very, very conflicting, maybe different styles of music, and um, and I, and I was thinking, what 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 is it about the Beatles and Scott Joplin that I find really interesting, and um, I I think both of those, both Scott Joplin and the Beatles, are are two um, two I guess artists, two acts that um, you could say music sounded one way before them and a different way after them. They are both that sort of hurricane, you know tremendous um, force in music that um, just changed the way um, changed the way music sounded and they both um, they both can credit that Scott Joplin growing up in the United States in the Midwest and the Beatles growing up in in the UK and um, they both were great, really adept at um, and very interested in absorbing all the music they could. Every they would listen. Both of those groups would the four guys in the Beatles and Scott Joplin would really drew from so many different styles of music. Anything they could get their hands on, their ears on, um, they used to influence their music. And I, I, I really appreciate that. I can appreciate that um, today in the music I listen to. Um, both of them came from sort of humble beginnings, very different, but definitely humble beginnings. And um, <clears throat> believe it or not, they're really a, not completely self-taught. Scott Joplin certainly studied music formally, but they really developed and honed their skills and um, learned so much on their own, which is pretty remarkable. Um, I also think it's interesting that um, given the dance aspects and the, the uh, bits of dance that, that's going to be happening here over the next two days, that um, both rock and roll and early ragtime started primarily as uh, music to be danced to. It was dance music. And um, Scott Joplin developed ragtime into something he wanted to develop into concert music, and he took it very seriously. And the Beatles also took rock and roll and, you know, developed it and... Um, to, to really um, high arts, uh, artistic standards. So um, I thought that was both pretty interesting. Pro primarily tonight, though, I'm going to talk about Scott Joplin. Um, we all know and love the Beatles very much, and there's so much to, um, to talk about with those guys. But um, I think Scott Joplin is probably a, a little less familiar to most people. So I thought we would spend some time talking about his, his life and his influences and his music. Um, we're going to be here for about 40 minutes or so, and um, really both of those groups, the, the Beatles and Scott Joplin, deserve many more hours of study and listening than just that, that little bit. So, um, so here it is, Scott Joplin's life. He was born, he had an incredible life. I mean, it, it's, it, it's almost, it, it can be difficult to study at this time period in the 19th century in America. It's, it's filled with just awful racial things, racial tensions, and, and it, it can be tough to uh, read about this. And, um, so anyway, Scott Joplin was born in, uh, on November 24th in 1868, only five years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And his father was, was born a slave, and he was freed in the Emancipation Proclamation. His name was Giles Joplin, and he was a violinist. <clears throat> he lived in Texas, and he was freed. Um, in 1863. His mother was born free. Her name was Florence, and um, she was a banjo player and singer. 
So he had that influence growing up in his, in his home of listening to violin music and also listening to um, banjo music and lots of singing. He had several siblings and they all played music. Um, I want to give you just a little bit of music. This is a, a recording from the 30s. Obviously, there were no recordings back in, eight, in the 1800s, but um, this is some um, Southern African American banjo music, um, perhaps something that Scott Joplin would have heard. <laughs> Pretty neat. It's a recording. I think that was recorded in 1938. But um, really neat from a historical perspective. You hear that banjo, that sort of driving rhythm in the banjo and the and the the vocal part. That, that's a song called Alabama Red. So um, pretty neat stuff. Something that Scott Joplin very very well may have listened to. Um, but Scott Joplin is known as a piano player. But uh, in early life, when he was a child, he played guitar. He was he's a pretty accomplished guitarist and singer. And um, when he was still pretty young, I want to say in his, when he was like eight or nine years old, his father left the family and moved away. And he, he was left with his mother and siblings. And his mom, um, needing to make some, earn some extra income, started cleaning houses for some of the wealthy people in um, Texarkana, the city that they lived in. And Scott Joplin would often, often accompany her on her trips, on her jobs. And that's where he was really introduced to the piano. He would go into these homes where there were pianos, and he was fascinated. And he would spend the whole time that his mom was cleaning the house plucking out tunes on the piano. And he, he, his, um, he, his skills grew very quickly. Um, so that, that was his introduction. And his mom really encouraged him to pursue a career in music. When he spoke with his father, his father insisted that he learn a trade and, and find a job that way, earning money. But his mom really encouraged his, um, his musical talent. So um, in this city, there was a, a German-born composer, a music professor named Julius Weiss, who um, heard Scott Joplin play and offered to teach him music for free. He, he taught him piano lessons, he taught him sight reading, and he taught him music theory. And uh, Weiss also, well, a little bit of his background, he was born in the 1840s in Germany and moved to the United States in 1870 um, and spent the next five years, he actually lived in the Hudson Valley, not far from here in, um, in New York State. And in 1877, he settled in uh, Texarkana, Texas, and was a music professor in that, in that town. So um, through him, he was able to, um, Scott Joplin was able to learn solid piano technique, he learned composition, he learned theory, um, and Weiss was exposed him to great German classical composers. So he, he learned the music of Beethoven, he learned the music of Bach, and um, he you know, could learn to play it, he learned counterpoint, um, and he was also exposed to uh, 19th century opera. Weiss was a big opera fan, and um, and Scott Joplin also, and that, that um, learned, learned a good deal about opera. So <clears throat> there it is, Weiss. It, interestingly, they, they remained friends for most of their lifetime. And later in life, when um, Julius wife was, Weiss was down on his luck, he, be, um, he was pretty destitute later in life, and Scott Joplin would mail him money. So he financially supported him in the latter years of his life. So they had, they had a very, um, very close relationship. It was very, pretty cool. Um, so there you have it. So Scott Joplin, we think of him as a quintessential, like 19th century American composer. And that, I mean, we think, what, what really is American music? And American music is, if, if nothing else, is an amalgamation of so many different styles. And I think we see that in um, Scott Joplin's music. We are, he is influenced by German classical music, the art music of the 18th and 19th century, and also um, banjo playing that we just heard a second ago, um, vocal music, he accompanied um, church singing, um, 
and his father's violin music. So his, his influence was, were so incredibly diverse. And I think that's, that's true for a lot of American artists. <clears throat> so, okay, M moving on. Scott Joplin, he was really young. He studied music. When he was only 14 years old, he moved away to pursue a career as a uh, professional musician. Um, at that time, pianists were in really high demand. You could find work, uh, as much work as you wanted to take, you could, you could find work as a pianist. Uh, this was before uh, recording, right? So if you wanted to hear music, you had to play it yourself or find someone else to play it. And uh, pianists were in high demand. <clears throat> uh, player pianos were invented at this time, but not, they weren't really, um, they, they didn't really reach their zenith of popularity until the like early 1910s and into the middle 19, uh, middle uh, 1920s. So, um, and he's found work even at the age of 14. He was playing in bars. He was playing in brothels. He was playing for traveling shows. He was filling in at churches. And with all these diverse experiences, he was meeting musicians from all over the country and um, just absorbing all of that music and honing his skills as um, an improviser. He improvised, he accompanied dance, he accompanied songs, he accompanied, uh, it was background music half the time, but he was constantly playing. He was getting into duels with pianists where they would compete for, you know, the, the most virtuoso pianist and who could do this and that and who could play faster or whatever, you know, they, it was, um, uh, yeah, so that was Scott Joplin from the age of 14. That's really, really young. You know, that's my daughter's uh, 14. She's in ninth grade. I can't imagine. Like, that's that's pretty uh, pretty strange. So, um, and that that's what he did for for quite some time. And he actually did pretty well. He made a substantial living, like, at least for that time and his skills and his age. And then in 1895, he really started, um, or he began to. Um, take music a little bit more seriously. And he settled down in Missouri and formed a quartet and started composing and actually writing down music on paper and composing for this quartet. His brother, one of his brothers was in the quartet and they toured around, they, they played as far away as, um, I think they, they performed shows in Syracuse, Oneonta, like different spots in upstate New York. They, they traveled pretty extensively. And he wrote music for them. He wrote, he wrote songs that he arranged for four-part four voice. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, that, that, was, that was his life for the next couple of years. And then in 1897, he heard some ragtime music that was actually composed and written down. And I'm gonna play a couple of these for you in a second. And so the first two ragtime pieces, when I think of ragtime, I think of pretty much exclusively Scott Joplin, but there was a number of ragtime composers. And the first two ragtime pieces for piano that were um, published, that were composed, notated, and published, um, one of them was called the Mississippi Rag. It was composed by a, a, a composer named William Krell. I'll give you a little snippet of that. It sounds like this. Mississippi Rag by William Krell, um, published in 1897. Uh, the next piece um, was uh, titled The Harlem Rag, and it was composed by a composer named Tom Turpin. And it sounds like this, a little bit, I think a little bit closer to um, Scott Joplin's music. Let's see. called the Harlem Rag. 
by Tom Turpin, published in um, 1897. So, and that year, 1897, is the year that Scott Joplin wrote his most famous piece called The Maple Leaf Rag. He, it wasn't published until two years later, but he composed it in 1897, and he believed, he told his friends that this was gonna be a hit, that this was gonna be a big song, and this was gonna really put him on the scene and make him famous, and he, and he was right. And this song, uh, this piece of music is um, the Maple Leaf Rag. Actually, he, he financially supported him, essentially, for the rest of his life. It was a tremendous, um, tremendous success. It was published, first published, by um, a publishing company called John Stark and & Sons. And the first year it was published, its first 12 months, it only sold 400 copies. So it wasn't terribly successful. A few copies. Then in the fall of 1900, it really took off, and it became the first piece of music to sell, the first piece of sheet music to sell a million copies which is really tremendous. If you think about the United States in 1900, I don't know what the population was, but um, there were only about 100,000 professional musicians and music teachers in the, in the country in 1900. So that's pretty astounding. That's 900,000 copies that went to just, you know, music lovers, amateurs. So re really, really um, impressive. And when we hear the maple leaf rag, I'm going to actually listen to the whole thing because it's a great piece and, wor and worth listening to. We, we hear that um, left hand accompaniment, that steady pulse, and the, the, the left hand is like bouncing back and forth from low notes to like middle register chords. And that is a device that ragtime pianists use especially so they could essentially use the whole resources of the piano the whole compass of the piano get a little bit more sound more um, low end to high end and a mimic more of a, an orchestral sound in a sense and then the melody famous melody in the right hand the syncopated melody of, of the um that the left hand was accompanying and the um yeah so formally this piece um pretty much codified the, the formal structure that became ragtime music. And it was developed there, and Scott Joplin stayed with that formal structure for, mo for the, most of his career, his compositional career. And that, that structure essentially is um, A, A, B, B, A, C, C, D, D. So you have an A section that repeats, then a contrasting B section that also repeats. Then we come back to the A section, um, and we hear something new, completely new, to uh, a C section, which that also repeats, and almost always that is in a different key, usually in a fourth away from the tonic, the key that the um, beginning is in, but almost always in a, in a different key. And then we have some new material to end with, a D section, and then that is repeated. So um, let's give it a listen. This is the Maple Leaf Rag, familiar to all of us, but a great piece of music, the first piece of sheet music to sell a million copies. So. Let's see.
a great piece of music, really is great piece of American music. Um, and Scott, Scott Joplin at this time was insisting, well, not insisting, but he, he really started taking this music much more serious, right? It wasn't just music to be played in bars and brothels and traveling shows or as background music. He insisted that this, he, he really desired for this music, for his music to be concert music, to be performed on stage, to be taken seriously. And um, we see that in the, in, as his music develops, that this, he's really insistent that um, this is perf uh, concert music, you know, to be formed on stage and to be really listened to. And um, yeah, that's it. So the Maple Leaf Rag, a great piece of music. And he wrote many, many rags, many songs, many pieces of music. He collaborated with um, other composers. But uh, moving on, we're going to listen to a, little, a couple other things. Um, two years later, after the success of the Maple Leaf Rag, one of his more famous pieces, he um, composed a piece called The Entertainer. And this piece was dedicated to James Brown and his mandolin club. So I'm not sure who James Brown was or his mandolin club, but um, this piece was dedicated to that. I think it's supposed to give you, give you the sense of um, club music, of entertainment. So we're going to listen to a little. This was um, published, composed and published in 1902 in sheet music form. And then in 1910, it was released as a piano roll. So you could, you could purchase the piano roll and actually hear it as well. Scott Joplin did not play the piano roll. He did not record it. There are recordings, piano rolls that he actually did record, but they were done pretty, pretty much right at the end of his life. So um, yeah, here, here's a little bit of The Entertainer. Something we all know. <laughs>
entertainer, a great piece of music. Um, so that was 1902 that uh, Scott Joplin released, published that music. Great piece. So um, when I hear those recordings, they sound very, like, kind of slow to me in a sense. And when, you, when I hear ragtime, when I, when I play it myself, when my students play it, sometimes they just speed up, right? And it, t it takes off. It's really, you have to like resist the urge to, to play too quickly. And I think in pianists in the early 1900s it took this music and some of them still used it as a platform for improvisation and competition with other pianists who could play this the fastest or who could improvise on it. And this really bothered Scott Joplin quite a bit. <laughs> he, beginning in 1901, I've looked through all of his scores and in beginning in 1901, he has a note at the top of every piece that says not too fast, right? Don't play this fast. And then 1902, he just shortens it. Like the pieces from 1902 on just say not fast. And then beginning in 1905, all of his compositions, he has a note at the top, and it says, note, do not play this piece fast. It is never right to play ragtime, he puts ragtime in quotes, fast, then sign the composer. So he, he really trying to pull back and make people listen and take this seriously, and not just use it as a, a, as a, a platform for improvisation or um, competition or whatever, virtuosity but to really listen, um, which is, is neat, right? He, he really is, he, he really developed this style of music and, and to, took it very seriously. In 1908, he published a school of ragtime. He was really insistent that people learn, learn to play this music correctly because he heard it played in all kinds of different ways with you know swinging the rhythm or too fast or not playing the rhythms accurately and um, I think it's interesting that the, the, the school of ragtime is essentially just a set of six exercises, and each exercise looks at a different um, technical problem that the pianist would encounter in ragtime music. And there's about a paragraph or so that goes along with each exercise explaining what the point of it is and, and how to um, play, perform it correctly. I think it's interesting, though, to get his take on the remark at the beginning, which I'll, I'll just read to you quickly. It's not very long. It says, what is scurriously called ragtime is an invention that is here to stay. This is now conceded by all classes of musicians, that all publications masquerading under the name of ragtime are not the genuine article will be better known when these exercises are studied. The real ragtime of the higher class is rather difficult to play, is a painful truth which most pianists have discovered. Syncopation are no indication of light or trashy music, and to shy bricks at hateful ragtime no longer passes for musical culture. To assist amateur players in giving the Joplin rags an intoxicating effect intended by the composer is the object of this work. So a pretty neat little insight. He was known, there's not a lot known about his personality, but he was known to be, from the people that, the stories we do relate, he was known to be a very like easygoing, pretty nice person to hang out with. So um, that is, yeah, the school of ragtime. Moving on, let's um, let's listen to like one one more piece of his, and um, it's very it's a really contrasting in in texture and style to what we just heard. It's called Solace, a Mexican serenade. It was composed and published in 1909. So after you know a decade after Scott Joplin had really started to be recognized and um, as a series composer and really achieve uh, a fair amount of fame. So. 1909, this, is, this piece is called Solace.
just talk about it. It's a beautiful piece of music. One of my favorite pieces by Scott Joplin. It's really great. Solace. It's called A Solace, a Mexican Serenade. Uh, really nice. So that was published in, composed and published in 1909. <clears throat> okay, Mo moving on. Um, S Scott Joplin, as he has he developed his compositional style and his compositional traits, he was really promoting this music. He was work. He was a tre tremendously hard worker, and kept trying to push the the boundaries and learn and develop his craft. Um, a few years after this, I think this was 1911. I, I might be wrong on that, but this, this is called the Ragtime Dance, actually, and it's it's a piece that's originally composed for narrator, singer, and five dancers. Which it was really neat. The, uh, the dance directions, he wrote out dance directions and how the dancers, uh, essentially choreography, how he wanted them to dance. That, that page has been lost, unfortunately. But we do have um, the narrations and, that are written into the score and when the dancers are supposed to dance or start dancing and when they're supposed to change to the next section and things like that. So this is called Ragtime Dance. And it's interesting because I, I kind of, I think of this piece um, in some ways like um, a classical composer, like say Beethoven, for instance, would, would compose a string quartet in a, in a, as, as a method of sort of working through some compositional ideas that he had and working out some compositional problems before he starts employing those techniques in a, in a symphony, in a larger work. And towards the end of his life, Joplin gets into much bigger works, and I kind of think of this as a step in that direction. And again, it's bringing, it's also, in like we're relating this to the dance that's coming here tomorrow, so it's like, reifying that we're, that this music was really intended to be danced to, as much as listened to. So this is called the Ragtime Dance. Let's see if we can find this. There we go. This does not have the singers. Ragtime Dance by Scott Joplin. So a really cool piece, and he's really kind of trying down new ideas. And in, in, they're very, his his music be, was very famous, and he often arranged his own pieces of music for various um, different instrumentations, and he would add um, lyrics and include vocalists. So the original um, Ragtime Dance was supposed to have a singer, a narrator, and and dancers, and directions for the pianist to also stomp his feet when he was playing. When she, yeah. So um, I don't think that came through on that recording, but a really neat piece. He's really pushing the boundaries. So where this is leading me, though, to is, is his final piece that he composed, and it was, it was an opera. He was very interested in opera, and a lot of that had to do with his studies with Julian Weiss back when he was a child, and the exposure he had to operas, probably operas of Mozart and mid or early 19th century operas, European operas. So. 
um, <clears throat> in addition to Mozart. So anyway, he wrote, he actually composed two operas. And the first one was called The Guest, uh, Guest of Honor. It was composed in uh, 1902, but unfortunately the score has been lost for that. So we didn't, we, we've never heard a recording of that. The uh, score was lost. Scott Joplin had come into some financial troubles and owed someone money and they broke into his house and confiscated that score along with some other things. So <laughs> there, there goes that piece, unfortunately. It reminds me of, like one of J.S. Bach's sons sold some of Bach's sheet music to, uh, to a meat packer to wrap meat in, right? <laughs> there goes some of the greatest works of art of Western civilization um, were wrapping meat in. So yeah, this was confiscated by a, a debt collector, unfortunately. That was called the, A Guest of Honor, and we really know almost nothing about that piece. So. Um, his final piece was called Tre Manja, and it was an opera. Uh, he, he began composing in 1911. Um, and the, the story of the opera is set in an ex-slave plantation in Texas. And there is a girl, her name is Tremanja, who's the, the, the main character, and she is taught to, to read and write by um, one of her, uh, by an older woman in the town. And she it makes it her mission to try to educate the people, her community, essentially, and as a way of protecting them from swindlers and like silly superstitions and different things that she felt was um, affecting their, their, their community. So that, that's essentially, I mean, the, the story is, the plot's a little longer than that, but that's, that's essentially what um, the piece began on. So it was composed, or began composing, he began composing this in 1911 for full orchestration, singers, dancers. Um, and he, at this time, he had moved from St. Louis. He was now living in New York City. He was living on, I forgot the number, but it was 131st Street in New York City, so up in Harlem. And um, yeah, really neat. He, he worked on this really, um, this, the work on this really wore, wore him out. He worked on it incessantly, um, and he gave up his, a, lot, a primary source of income for him at this time was teaching, piano and teaching music, and he pretty much ignored all of his teaching responsibilities, so he lost that income. He, he ignored like other arrangements and other commissions that he had and really just dedicated his time to this, um, to this opera. And um, <clears throat> uh, um, yeah, so anyway, this, this, um, this piece, it was only performed one time during his lifetime, right before he died. And it was performed with him on the piano and with the, um, the cast in the opera, but no costumes, no scenery, no or orchestration, nothing like that. It was really bare bones production and it did not go over too well. And then the piece was essentially shelved until 1972, so long after he died. He died in 1917. So this was just a few years before he, he passed away. Um, and he spent majority of his time and resources working on this piece. His wife at the time was named Lottie and she actually rented out rooms and ended up renting out rooms in their in their apartment or in their um, house in on 131st street just to to generate some income so there was lots of people coming in and out of the building and he was in the basement basement in their apartment just working non-stop on this and he had we have a, a kind of a neat story um from Another ragtime composer, his name is Sam Patterson. He was much younger than Scott Joplin, but I think he studied with Scott Joplin and was a ragtime composer in his own right. But he was helping Scott Joplin um, write out the orchestration. So Scott Joplin would compose it and then he hand it over to Sam and Sam would like write out, like say the violin part or the, the soprano part, different. So he was helping him with the the scoring of the piece. And uh, he, he describes, Sam describes that they worked on this like nonstop. They would come into this basement apartment and work on it for days, all day long. And they would only take a break for lunch. And he, Sam uh, describes in, in one of his interviews from later on that a typical uh, lunchtime at, at, with Scott Joplin, Joplin said, let's knock off here. I, I hear Lottie coming. And just, uh, so he said, just then the phone rang and I went to answer it. When I came back, there were fried eggs on the table and Lottie was opening a bottle of champagne some folks she worked for had given her. I said, these eggs are cold. And Scott looked at me and said, look, Sam, if they're good hot, they're good cold. And they ate and got back to work. So kind of a funny story. <laughs> um, yeah, so Trey Manja. Um, it was performed in 1915 
And I would like to play one of the neat things, bringing this back to dance, there's actually a ballet number that he composed into this piece. It, it occurs in the second act. And the main character, Chirmanja, at this point is being um, sort of sequestered, held down by these like superstitious spirits or something that are sort of to tormenting her, her community. And this is called the frolic of the bears where all these beasts come and do this like ballet dance in front of her. So full orchestration, a cool piece called the frolic of the bears from Trey Modular. Kind of a cool piece, a little bit different than Maple Leaf Rag and The Entertainer, but really neat. It's a great opera. If you have the opportunity to check it out, I really encourage you. It's not performed overly often, but um, find a DVD or a uh, recording. It's really neat, called Trey Manja. So that was performed only once without orchestration, without costumes, without scenery in 1915. Two years later, um, Scott Upland died. He was only 48 years old, pretty young but he composed a tremendous amount of music. Um, after he died, ragtime really fell out of fashion quite a bit. At least that's what people claim, and it was replaced by jazz. Jazz became incredibly popular in the 1920s. Louis Armstrong and um, Duke Ellington <clears throat> became popular really in the, in the 1920s. Um, and then in the 1970s, decades later, 50 years later, there was um, a movie called The Sting that used Scott Joplin's music as soundtrack, and that, that helped really revitalize this. And then um, there were a couple mu mu composers and musicologists that developed an interest in ragtime again, uh, like Bill Albright and Bill Bolcom, and um, <clears throat> they they um, not only wrote wrote their own ragtime music, but also promoted and tried to um, resurrect some of Scott Joplin's music. And they um, recruited this guy named Joshua Rifkin, who's a pianist and musicologist, to record uh, Scott Joplin's music. And that album came out in 1971, I want to say, if I remember correctly, um, was the first album on the Nonesuch label to also sell a million copies. So um, became inc incredibly popular again. Some people, some musicologists, some jazz critics, um, Rudy Blush, for one of them, was a jazz critic. He died in the 1980s, but he was around. He, he knew um, during Scott Joplin's lifetime and um, certainly in the early years of jazz. He claimed that ragtime never really went away. It just, it became jazz. That jazz pianists like um, James P. Johnson and Fats Waller were really just very skilled ragtime pianists. So he claimed that it never really went away. But that, um, that was it. So um, tomorrow night, that's about all I have for now. I hope that was informative and you enjoyed listening to 
some Scott Joplin music, dig some of this music up. It's really great. It's great American art form. And I um, encourage you to listen to some more. So tomorrow night, we will, the ballet will be here, the Chevalier Ballet, dancing to music of Scott Joplin to some of his rags. And then they'll be back again on Saturday for um, the Beatles. Be the Beatles, uh, ballet meets the Beatles. So thank you. Have a good night. And hopefully we'll see you soon. <laughs>